uh, just quickly, I want to run through a few things. Um, it's, been, it's been a while since we've had a sprint review. Um, we normally have these every four weeks. This time we waited eight weeks. And so um, we've had, I don't know how many new people joining the project um, since the last sprint review. So typically we do this after every two sprints. Um, this time we've waited for four sprints, which represented um, a lot of IRS hot fixes and um, finishing Juniper functionality and Juniper bug fest and bug fixes. So it's been crazy times in the Folio project, but then again, I'm not sure we ever don't have crazy times. Um, we've had a lot of people joining various teams and uh, we always had a bunch of slides of the teams that we would just kind of zoom through. Instead of having every team member of every team listed in the PowerPoint, we now have uh, just a list of what all of the teams are and the areas that they're responsible for. And for the teams that have their uh, a space on the wiki, there's a hot link in the PowerPoint to the, um, uh, the team space where you can see the team members and, and more details about their, what they're working on. Um, we now have so many teams, it's gone to three pages of teams instead of two. And uh, here in the developer directory and in the responsibility matrix, you can get more information. For me, the responsibility matrix is the most useful place because if you have any project in JIRA and you want to know which team's responsible for it, um, you can look there and, and get guidance as to the product owner and the tech lead for that project. Um, we've had a couple of product owner updates and I'm going to stop talking and uh, let Kalila have the floor for a few minutes. Thanks, uh, Amory. Hey, everybody. Um, so we just a couple of uh, development team uh, and also PO updates. So uh, for Firebird, uh, this is a, a team that uh, Steph Buck has been the uh, PO for, uh, well, since uh, it's a uh, start. Um, she will no longer be the uh, primary PO for Firebird. Magda will become that uh, PO. Um, it the team will absorb the, the previously known team of Concord as well, and will become the new owners of Data Export, Export Manager, and OAI PMH. Um, they'll continue to maintain and support uh, remote storage and circulation log development. Staff will remain the product owner for those uh, uh, apps and modules. Um, Steph will become the lead PO for uh, Vega. Uh, as many of you may or may not know, uh, Darcy uh, uh, has, uh, is no longer the, the, the Vega PO. She uh, is um, no longer a PO for the project. Um, and so Steph will take on that role. Uh, she, that the team will work on title level requests. Um, I'm sorry, I should, she, and, and also will work on remote storage and, I mean, we'll work on title level requests. Um, I think that just represents that uh, Steph is the PO for remote storage and circulation log. And, and Julie, uh, who, and she's already been doing this, it will, will continue to be the PO for, for patron notices. Um, Want to also just thank Darcy for all, all she did for the last, uh, well, uh, as a PO for, for Vega and working on patron notices and, and other things uh, as, as a, a member of the Folio community as a PO. So uh, just want to thank Darcy for everything she did and, and um, that's it. All right, thank you, Kalila. And yes, I think we're all gonna miss Darcy and the, uh, the, the really good resource access folks that we've had over the last the last uh, couple of years that, that have moved on to different things. Um, one other um, module change I'll just mention because it happened yesterday is that um, Steph not only gets Vega, but Vega is picking up the PubSub module from Folajet because we're no longer using it for data import anymore. 
Um, so all the um, flows that are using it are now Vega. So it seemed like it made sense for PubSub to go to Vega, um, but we did clean it up a lot before we handed it over. So all of those changes uh, should be reflected in the matrix um, in the next few days if they're not already. All right, um, as far as release timelines, um, we I think we've all been involved in every single one of these, it feels like. Um, we uh, had Hotfix 2 and Hotfix 3 in the time that's covered by this sprint review. Um, we are all working on finishing our Juniper bug fixes, which uh, should be released by tomorrow and double checked and finalized by Friday. And then we're aiming for the general release of Juniper um, two weeks from yesterday. So um, if you have managed to avoid all of Anton's um, uh, pleading to make sure that we get them finished, this is yet another one. Um, make sure that anything that's a Juniper bug fix, um, you've you've got a plan for it and it's gonna be done and checked by Friday. And if not, then please consider moving it to Kiwi. At this point, we do not have a Juniper hotfix planned and the preference is not to have one. Um, there uh, is a small hotfix for coming for Iris that so far includes a couple of Thunderjet um, uh, updates. That's the only, the last bit of Iris that I'm aware of. And hopefully we are all in the process of turning our attention to Kiwi, um, which is additional functionality, but also lots of automated test writing and uh, cleanup of modules. So all of the timelines are on the website and you've got links for them there. Something we did as of last sprint review, but just a reminder is that we decided to start putting the sprint demo uh, sprint reviews with the uh, flower release that they belong with. So when the recording for this is available, it will be put onto a page along with the previous one for the Juniper sprint demos. And then we'll start a new Kiwi one uh, starting with the next sprint demo so that that way you're able to see the new functionality of that flower release along with the timeline and all the other details of the release. And we have our standard um, sprint highlights, which I think you'll see for pretty much everybody. It's, it's fixes and releases and prep for Kiwi and test prep. And we won't spend a lot of time, but you can always go through these at your leisure because the real thing we wanna spend time on is the demos. So we've got a good uh, list of demos this, this time around. Um, hopefully we will get through everything quickly. Um, folks, if you could just keep a time, that the, those of you who are early in the list, if you could just try to keep it tight for your time, that would be great for the folks that are later on the list. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn things over to Andre and Tatiana from Thunderjet. Yes, and Saint Marie. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm, believe you can see it. If no, let me know. Yes. Um, thank you. So I'm going to demonstrate two features that our team have been implemented uh, during last sprints. Um, uh, the first one is regarding selecting holdings during um, this cre creation. And uh, last demo, this the part of this feature was uh, demonstrated for peer line creation. And now we have the same functionality for uh, receiving app. So um, we have a title that connected uh, with uh, peer line. Here we can see the number of it. And uh, also connected to our inventory instance. So. If we are going to inventory, we'll see 
uh, that this instance uh, uh, have three holdings. And if we were going to add piece, uh, so we need to add some information. And uh, here we can see select holdings and we can see in dropdown list uh, three holdings that we have in inventory. And uh, the same uh, as uh, we have in peer line form, we can uh, select one of the holdings from the list. Oh, we can create new holding. So let's create new one mm, for, <coughs> for example, this location. We can say we can uh, create item to see and changes in inventory and uh, let's save it. Uh, our piece is created and if we are going go to the inventory again and update the page we'll see that uh, new holding was created and uh, our item is here. So um, if we it's um, this feature works uh, for um, titles uh, that are connected uh, to um, inventory instance. So if no, we can uh, select a location as we have uh, in uh, previous uh, edition. So I think that's it for this feature. And uh, let's go to the next one. It's uh, in orders and uh, we create, we reduce uh, uh, some steps for uh, PO line creation. So now it's uh, easiest to create uh, more than one uh, PO line. And uh, um, let's see how it works. Uh, firstly, we need to go to settings and check uh, yeah, that we can uh, uh, create more than one PO line for one push solder. Uh, return back to orders and uh, let's uh, create uh, the PO line so we can see uh, that uh, we have a new button with label create another we can select it and uh, the save button label changed uh, from save and close to save and now we need to uh, fill out uh, required fields. And save. Uh, we can see that uh, pure line was created, uh, but uh, previously we usually goes to, we go to details screen, pure line details screen. But now if uh, create another, checkbox is checked, uh, we can uh, proceed with the creating new one. And uh, let's create new one, the same. And since uh, checkbox is checked, we'll create new one and we know that we can create only two PO lines for each uh, push solder. So if we try to create more, then we have limited. Oh, and try to save, we'll see uh, that push solder lines limit reached and we can uh, proceed with creating new precious order and or can break this. And if we close without saving this pair line, we'll see that our precious order have uh, now two pair lines that we have created just now. Mm, I think that's it from my side uh, and Tatiana will uh, present uh, one new cool feature. So, Tatiana. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Well, let me share my screen. Yeah, let me share my screen. 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, excellent. Yes. So uh, the feature uh, was to allow user to link an invoice line to a PO line after the invoice line has been created. On the screen, the GOB invoice is created from an imported uh, edifact uh, file. It's not approved or paid uh, for purchase order lines Purchase orders are created and opened. The first four invoice lines are linked to a purchase order lines and the rest are not. So uh, if I want to link uh, this invoice line to a PR line, I click on it. Uh, yeah, I click edit invoice line. When the edit invoice line screen is opened, I copy vendor reference number uh, to find the needed PO line. Then I click uh, on the PO line lookup, the lookup for select uh, PO lines is opened and I search PO line by the copied vendor reference number and I select PO line. After that, uh, as we can see, fields, description, and fund dis distribution is updated. So, uh, so then I click on the save and close button and uh, invoice line has been saved. So as we can see, it has pure line number and fund code. And finally, uh, my invoice line is linked to the PO line number. Also, user can link an invoice line to a PO line when an invoice source is not ready. Um, that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. All right, so totally biased, but my favorite update of today because uh, there was so much work that went into Edifact invoice import and then this um, being able to link them up after the fact to the correct purchase order line. So um, delighted to see that. All right, so next up is Firebird, Sergey and Alexei. And uh, I figured out we've got 10 demos, so we've got about seven minutes per person, per, per team. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Sergey, and uh, I want uh, to present uh, KaiaSoft uh, Accession Flow. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to uh, check my security settings. Maybe Alexei will start and then I will continue after him. Uh, yes, okay. okay. Alexei? Yes, okay. And you may have to stop sharing. Uh, yes. Okay. It kind of looks like the Delta Airlines logo right now. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, uh, do you see it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, I have prepared some initial data to test and to show you because it's rather huge pipeline. So at first step, I already have created um, special configuration for KSOF provider in general. Uh, I'm going to show you how modern remote storage communicate with uh, KSOF provider. So we have, uh, I have created a remote storage, new remote storage for KSOF provider and set um, special credentials and endpoint to which uh, we should send our request. Be besides, I have created um, uh, time in minutes here, it's time, 
which mean how often uh, modern remote storage tried to send a request to Kaisot provider. So I have done it previously because if a new uh, configuration will be created, sometimes it needs something about an hour uh, to be initialized. So let's go to inventory page. And here I also created already some test instance and to show how that communication is work, I'm going to create some item. So I will going to create a new item. Uh, let's call it this barcode uh, here. Here the type and uh, uh, here I should uh, pick up a location which connect with remote storage configurations that I have already uh, show you. I have named it test location. I am going to find it. Uh, this this one, so same. Save and close. So now you see that my new item was created, and I need to create a page request for it. So going to request page. Previously, copy this one. Uh, request page, action, you. Here I enter barcode, page request type. Let's set up some date. Here I need to check some inform some request. I will pick this one. Uh, okay, and here I need to pick up some service point. He is not so important, but I will pick, for example, this one and save. So now page request. Uh, okay, it's created. Let's double check here. You see that total number of is 17, so I expect to have plus one. Let's see. This one, so that means that retrieval record is created, this one, and our module remote storage should communicate with each Kaisoft model and to send this record to some Kaisoft uh, provider, which set up here. Sometimes it need up to 10 minutes. So if we look here, there is special field retrieval daytime. That means that the retrieval record uh, was pick up. Let's double check if it had already pick up. Yes, you see. Uh, besides we could do some another a request we could uh, set up a check-in by request ID. So I will copy this and change. So we see that it was successfully check in and let's double check by uh, using edge Kaisoft model in point and let's double check on follow page. So it will be inventory, test instance. This one, 
and the date was changed to check-in date. And that's all from my side. Wow. All right. That's impressive. And yeah. it went to in transit. Wow. That is way cool. Yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. So, all right, Sergey, what do you oh, think? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I will try to share my screen. One second. I need to stop sharing my one. <laughs> I just try to find this button. That's uh, yeah. the hardest part yes. is finding the button. So Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, Carlsoft uh, uh, provides uh, two approaches uh, to perform accession uh, for the items. Uh, so, I created two configurations, one for duplicate holdings and one for change permanent location. So, if we go to the inventory, you can see I created uh, several uh, instances with sample data. So in uh, the very uh, simple case, uh, both approaches will change uh, holdings uh, permanent location if uh, they contain only one item or if all other items uh, within these holdings uh, already have a remote location. So let's see how it works. Uh, you can see two items within uh, this holding, uh, one item is already accessioned and uh, the second one uh, need to be accessioned. So if we change uh, its permanent location to remote and save it, then we need to leverage uh, our uh, KaiSoft uh, endpoint. So we have, uh, we need to specify item barcode and uh, remote storage ID and a PIK for, uh, for access. So you can see that our item 001 was accessioned and now we can check it on UI. So you can see that holdings location was changed to Kaiosoft and both items within uh, this holding uh, are, uh, has a remote location. So the second case uh, is uh, when um, both items within holdings uh, are non-remote and uh, in this case, um, and if we have uh, already have a holding with a remote location, then if we try to uh, make accession on some item, so let's take 003 and try to change its location. Now we'll leverage the endpoint again. So you can see that accession was done. Now we'll check it. And you can see that uh, the item 003 was moved to the Microsoft holding. And uh, the last case for duplicate holdings uh, strategy is uh, when um, uh, both items are non-remote and we have no holding with uh, the remote location. So let's take the item 005 and change it location to remote. and perform accession once again. So it was accessioned and we can see that our holding was duplicated. Uh, it was uh, created a new holding uh, with remote location and the item was moved to this holding. And the second item remain in our previous holdings. So the second strategy is uh, change permanent location. Um, so if uh, we have several items within the holding, 
and uh, we need to uh, change uh, we need to access uh, to make accession to some item if uh, uh, an item has already specified permanent or temporary location it will uh, remain unchanged accession item uh, will uh, will stay in holding and the holding will um, uh, the holdings location will be changed uh, to to the remote and if uh, the item within this holding has no any location specified then uh, its uh, permanent location uh, will be set to the holdings previous location oh i'm sorry i need to change the holdings location it must be non remote So our holding is this uh, non-remote location. We can see that uh, one item 008 has specified permanent location and uh, an item 009 has no location specified. They both are empty. So if we perform location, It is already changed. So we can leverage our endpoint. So you can see that it was accessioned. And now, if we look at our holding, our update. So you can see that the holdings location was changed to remote. Our item 007 was changed to a remote location. Uh, 008 has uh, previously specified location and uh, the item 009 is now has permanent location main library, which was uh, the holdings previous location. That's all from my side. All right, that's looking really good and a lot of complexity it looks like. So thank you very much. Um, all right, the vegans are up. Um, Alexander? Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. So I'm going to demo our new report. It is called uh, Financial Transactions Details Report. It allows you to export fee fine information about fee fine actions like payments, transfers, refunds. Etc. So I've set up a patron here with a couple of fees fines. Uh, each one of them has multiple actions. You can see payments, waves, refunds, etc. And hopefully we'll see all of them in the report. So let's try to export it. As usual, we go to users, actions, and here it is. You can filter it by action date, start date is required, uh, owner is also required, you can only select one, and then I can filter it by one or multiple service point, but this owner only has one, let's select it, why not? So this is the report, as you can see, it's exported as CSV file, so the formatting is really up to the software you use to open it. Okay, so this section of the report is the main part. Each row here represents a single action, payment, refund, wave, etc. It has a lot of information about the action, obviously. And as usual, the links, this one, for example, brings us back to the fine detail page of the appropriate fine and all of the other sections here are different kinds of totals grouped by different parameters and you can see for example how much what, what is the total amount of payments in this report or how many payment actions are in this report or for example how much was waived for this particular reason 
So all of these sections are basically total amounts and total counts. Yeah, so we're still polishing this report and we're planning to release it in Kiwi. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Roman? Yeah, hi, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes. Good. I'd like to demo our new feature. This is a truncate due date based on pattern expiration date for uh, renewing. I have already configured uh, loan policy with two days of loan period and um, renew from uh, current due date. Uh, and also I said, uh, keep the current due date, uh, closed library due date management. Then I set up uh, this policy in circulation rule for book material type and uh, Roman pattern group. Uh, also, I created a user, uh, which expiration date is 6th of uh, August. Now I'm going to do a checkout for, for a book. The due date is uh, 5th of August. Uh, now uh, let's go to launch and uh, try to do a renew. If I do a, a renew, uh, we add two days uh, to the current due date. It would be uh, 7th of August, but uh, the pattern expires, uh, expires earlier. Uh, it's uh, 6th of August and due date will be truncated to the patron's expiration date. Uh, this is because we have chosen uh, keep the current due date strategy in the loan policy. So let's renew it and check. Yeah, this is uh, 6th of August. Now uh, I'm going to uh, change uh, the closed uh, library due date management in the loan policy. I'll choose uh, move to the end of the previous open day uh, closed library due date management strategy. And I'll do renew again. And now this is 5th of August because uh, for move to the end of the previous open day or move to the end of uh, the next open day strategies, uh, the due date should be truncated to the last open day before pattern expiration. Let's change uh, the strategy uh, to the end of the next open day. Yeah, uh, the due date is the same. And now let's make this uh, day closed in the calendar and uh, check that due date will be truncated to the end of, of the latest open day before pattern expiration. So I'll remove uh, this uh, opening hours from, from the schedule, save, and I'll try to do renew again. Yeah, now the last open day before pattern expiration is 4th of August. Uh, so that's probably it from, from my side, thanks. Wow, increasing complexity here too, but it looks like really useful functionality. All right, and Dimitri. Uh, 
Oh, I already started sharing my screen. Could you please say me will yes. you be see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, we add uh, several change uh, to the our check-in uh, model for consistency with other uh, our models. First of all, we move and session button to the bottom of the page. Also, we move uh, uh, date picker and time picker to the right corner. Uh, now we also use full screen white. Uh, for our model, we also add uh, uh, several minor changes, uh, something like uh, we change uh, button style for consistency with other page, uh, label text, and uh, label white and bold. That's all. Thank you. All right. Always nice to see some UI fixes. Okay, so next we move to the Falcons and Pavel. And yes, we see your screen. Mm, but we're not hearing you, you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Cool. So hello, everyone again. Uh, the first story I will show is adjusting uh, sorting by title. Uh, previously, the approach was that we sorting only by index title, and uh, not, not, not the index title, but resource title. But for now, we are able to adjust sorting results using the index title value. So I will perform the search again. Yeah. And now you see the resources, and one of them is starting for with the, uh, which is uh, looks like an incorrect order because uh, some resources is p, and it looks like this resource should be below this. But if you look at index title, uh, the sorting order is correct, and it works with the descending order too. Uh, the second adjustment for searching it would be sorting searching by contributors fields. Uh, previously, there was a, an issue when someone types John's and it would show a search results would include John as after two, but for now it has been fixed and uh, exact match for uh, contributor name is used. Uh, the results for John here, here, and here. That's it. Also, is that it can show from your side, and we'll, I will switch to the postman. Uh, the next story is about implementing new search types by series. For example, we can use this request, and we will be able to find resources with the same exact uh, series value. Uh, next one is ser searching by uniform title. It's an alternative title that has a specific type. I will show that this type is exactly a uniform title. There is a query to receive all titles with the name uniform title. And I just copy ID from that result. And as you can see, it's exact matching. Uh, next one is we added support for uh, searching for public and uh, staff only nodes by using for instances uh, holdings and items uh, the notation to search it would be for not staff only nodes uh, would, would be item public node public nodes and holding public nodes i've created few instances and i will show that for private node it's not working but if I change to the public node, I will be able to find this instance with this item. Yeah, there is two nodes for this resource. And if a tenant would like to find this by private node, you can use this notation. It's for a public node, and for private node, it's working too. The same works for holdings and items. 
are not items uh, instances. And the last story I will present, it would be uh, as that we added n variables for Kafka topics uh, and index names and uh, consumer groups. Uh, yeah, if I uh, try to create the index which already exists, it will check that this index with this name already uh, created for Elasticsearch. And this feature is essential for shared environments. So we can use one Elasticsearch cluster from different environments. Uh, the same uh, feature is implemented for Kafka, but this is really hard to uh, show in the demo. I guess that's me. Thank you for your attention. I know we've had issues with multiple Kafka topics in the past, so it's it's uh, multiple copies of the same Kafka yes. topic. So it's good to see that uh, corrected. All right, um, and now we move to Stripes Force and John. Hi, thanks, Anne Marie. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to demonstrate a new pagination feature of the results lists. Let me share my screen. All right. Now, uh, can you see uh, the inventory got, UI? All right. Uh, we've got a blue window. Uh -oh. uh oh, hang on. Let me. Let me share it a little bit differently. Share. All right, All right, now we got How it. How about now? Yeah, All right, yes. great. Good deal. OK, uh, so taking a browse, uh, looking at the, the bug fest uh, environment for Juniper uh, to get some healthy results sets in there. So uh, for, for, let me just see, see what size we can get here. Uh, so if I look at the, um, uh, so down at the bottom of the list, the most obvious change here is going to be now we have the pagination controls. Um, and so this is a new uh, prop that's set on the, uh, the MCL uh, display table, uh, the component that we all know and love for all of our result sets. Uh, in Folio, uh, so uh, to use the uh, the paging type uh, prop that it has uh, in setting it to previous next, prev next, um, it will render this pagination uh, display down at the bottom. So you can see you have previous and previous and next buttons, uh, as well as a display in the middle here. Uh, that will display the numbers uh, uh, in your in your collection of search results the current of the current page. So here on this page, we're viewing the results one to one hundred. Uh, if we page to the next item, or sorry, the next page rather, uh, you'll see that'll come through, and uh, then we're going to be at uh, one hundred one to two hundred now. Uh, so that's the uh, the pagination. Uh, uh, setting for MCL uh, sort of in a nutshell. Um, in future releases, we'll take this pagination component and break it out into its own uh, standalone component so that it could potentially be used in other places in Folio where you want to page through collections like this. Um, let's see, while I'm here, another little, uh, uh, yeah, you know, a usability tweak. Um, Kimi Kester, uh, one of the designers here at, Fol at uh, EBSCO, uh, Designers on Folio, uh, she pointed out a, a feature that we needed when we transitioned from these results lists to the um, to your detail pages. So clicking an item, uh, as you scroll in this list, if you click on an item here, you can see that the alignment of the item in the list uh, was retained. Uh, despite the pain and despite the UI changing size, 
of course, the, uh, the variability of the length of the text uh, on these fields, uh, particularly in inventory, but in plenty of other places in folio, it creates a challenge uh, for trying to keep things aligned in this manner. Uh, but now you can see uh, that's a functional nice feature uh, that the MCL component has. Um, and if your developers wanna learn more, they can check out the documentation uh, for the multi-column list. Uh, saving the place or that position in the list is the item to view prop. And uh, then we have the on mark position uh, prop that will help them save the position of that collect item. And you can take a look at how these are implemented uh, within inventory. So that's all I have for today. Okay, I lied. That may be my favorite fix of this demo, um, even though it looks so simple, because it is such a pain when you're trying to work your way through a list of results and you're, you can't easily tell where you are in the list when you go back to the list. So that's awesome. And I hope we'll do it in uh, some of the acquisitions apps and some of the other places. So thank you so much, John. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. And now we get user management. So Maura and Patty. Hello. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And, and I am uh, here as the studio audience. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> She's my hype man. Yeah, no canned um, laugh track. We are live. Right. OK, so does everybody see the user's screen? Yes. OK, good. Um, we are talking today about user deletions. Um, the you know user deletions sort of it's a one at a time function done through the UI. Um, so we can take a uh, a user and come to the actions and check for open transactions and delete the user. Uh, now this particular uh, this particular user has two open loans. So basically all of these. All of these things, loans, requests, fees, fines, blocks, and an unexpired proxy, these are all uh, dependency checks that this, um, that this function does. Uh, and it tells you that it won't delete the user. You don't get an option to delete the user um, until you have taken care of these transactions. Um, this is the case for, um, for, um, uh, for active loans, this is the case for requests. Yep. Uh, so there's a user with a request. Um, there is a user with a proxy. And if I choose to attempt to delete this user, there is an active unexpired proxy relationship. Um, the same is true if you have a um, uh, if you have a fee or a fine, um, but if you uh, if you have someone with no uh, transactions on their record and you wish to delete them, you still get um, you still get a, a, a modal that tells you that there are no open transactions. So this is also uh, a way to check for transactions on any user record without deleting them. Um, so those are those are the things. If you uh, if you wish to uh, delete a user um, or check for open transactions, um, they will all um, they will check all of these things: loans, requests, fees, or fines blocks or an unexpired proxy, if there are any of those things that are open, it will show you that there are some open and it will uh, prompt you to, uh, to resolve those transactions before you delete the user. You don't get the button to do so unless these things are all cleared out. Uh, and if you do pick someone who does not have any open transactions, you still get this modal, you just get the delete user button to go along with it. Really nice. Yes. And now I just have to figure out how to unshare. 
There we go. This is the test of all the demos, how to share <laughs> and unshare. Well, I hope I'm no longer sharing. All right. Okay. Um, all right. And for Thor, we have Niels Eric. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to uh, show you a new extension that we uh, made to uh, inventory. Um, and uh, do I share my screen now? Yes. Yeah, we see good. the bound with page. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, we extended inventory storage with the data structure to uh, store uh, information of uh, bound with items. Uh, uh, people familiar with inventory mm -hmm. knows the, the, the general structure. We have the hierarchy uh, of instances that have holdings that have items, uh, but with bound with it sort of turned upside down. So you can have an item that is uh, related to uh, multiple titles uh, so that you can bind those multiple titles into one item and circulate them as one item. And that is done with a structure where we link uh, the items up uh, to, to the holdings. And um, I have uh, uh, loaded uh, uh, five uh, uh, issues of a magazine here. Uh, and I, we want to, uh, uh, by the end of 2020, we want to uh, uh, bind these uh, uh, four quarterly uh, issues together uh, as, a, as a bound with. And let me move that out. So uh, I do that by uh, populating uh, this, uh, this uh, table. Uh, here with the relations between uh, holdings and items. And uh, you can see here we have a holdings record ID and item ID that I posted and then another one. Uh, and they're all for the same item ID, but different uh, holdings ID that uh, each relate to a different uh, uh, title. Uh, and uh, after refreshing, uh, uh, you see some uh, changes. Uh, for one thing, all the titles are now marked with a uh, uh, bound with, except for uh, the latest uh, quarterly issue that is not yet bound because we, we don't have uh, the other quarters to, to bind it with yet. But uh, those four that I bound there are marked uh, with an icon that is sort of an alert to the user that there's something special about this title. Uh, this doesn't mean that the title can only be part of a bound with, but it does mean that in some instances it, it would be. Also, when we look at the, the, the holdings, uh, we can see that the item we made the bound with is also marked as a, uh, with the, the bound with the icon. And when we uh, look at the item it, uh, in, in detail, uh, it's um, marked as a bound with up here. And uh, then uh, down here, I added a very rough a uh, table, it will uh, become a lot prettier when uh, real UI developers get their hand on it. Uh, but it uh, will show uh, the user all the uh, titles that are currently uh, bound together in this item and, uh, and, and thus circulated together. And that's it for me. All right, thank you, Nils Eric. Um, I know it's been a long time coming. All right, so I've lost my track. Um, reporting, Angela. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I think I'll have to wait until Nils. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> trying to find the. Uh, oh. Well. All right, you found Perfect. it. Uh, so I'm here to share um, progress on the LDP app. Um, the LDP app is an app, um, LDP stands for Library Data Platform, and for institutions that have uh, a library data platform, um, that platform is extracting data from Folio apps and transforming it and then loading it into a reporting database. This app connects to that platform and allows users to run queries against that database 
um, directly from Folio. And so uh, what I'm going to demonstrate today is a couple of very simple queries that use existing uh, data from Folio apps. Um, there are two kinds of, uh, there are two schemas that are currently visible in the LDP app. Um, there, if there's um, additional schemas in the LDP, they could also show up here, but here we only have the two schemas. In the public schema, the tables are created from pretty much a direct load of data from Folio apps with some slight transformations. Um, so all the tables in this schema are coming pretty uh, directly from the different apps like requests and loans and uh, courses and things like that. But these um, connect up to the different, uh, the different interfaces within those apps. So the first query I'm gonna show is uh, for example, in this um, public schema, you can go to the finance um, budgets interface or the table, and uh, we were, we're going to do a filter for the current fiscal year. And so I've copied the identifier for that fiscal year. I'm going to go to the fiscal year ID column in this table and filter it to that value. And you can add multiple filters. So to add another filter, you can just click the um, add filter button and I will also filter on budget status, which is active. And then um, you can even limit the number of columns that show up and the number of results and you can set the order by. I'm gonna hit submit first just to show the results. And you can see I'm starting to get the results for just that fiscal year, all the budgets within that fiscal year that I set in the filters, as long as they're active budgets. You can see the budget status here says active for all these records. Uh, but I can also limit the number of columns in this display. And I can do that by going into show columns and typing the ones that I do want. So I can get name, allocated, um, net transfers, available, and unavailable. And if I hit submit again, it will limit to just those um, columns that I'm interested in. And then I could export to CSV by clicking the, the disk icon. So um, this, is, this is very handy um, when you uh, have an interface that has all the fields that you're interested in, but sometimes we wanna be able to do queries that combine data from different apps or different, um, different APIs. So um, what this allows us to do is connect to a different schema called Folio Reporting. And the tables in this schema have been generated by uh, the reporting SIG. And the queries that build these tables allow us to transform the data even further to make it easier for reporting or to combine data from multiple apps. And so just as a, as a demonstration, I'll show you the difference between the items table in the public schema. So if you go to inventory items, you'll see it clears out all the filters from my previous search. Um, I can just hit submit so I can preview the data. And you can see that in this, uh, in this table, there are a lot of identifier columns that actually connect to other kinds of records. So for example, the material type ID lists the UUID, but not the name of the material type. So we um, would like to extend this data to show uh, those human readable names in our reports. And we can do that by creating special tables under folio reporting that remix the data a little bit more easily for us to understand. So in this um, schema, there is a, a table called item extended. And if you run the query for item extended, you get even more columns, but those extra columns that you get um, add a lot of value. So for example, as you're looking through some of these identifiers, now you have the name attached to those identifiers. So we've brought in the material type name We've brought in some of the location names, like the permanent location name for this item, et cetera. Um, so once we get into these um, derived tables, is what we call them under folio reporting, these derived tables actually give us a lot of um, bang for our buck for, uh, for reporting. So for example, if I want a quick report of all of the items that are currently in transit, I can um, go into this items extended table, I can look for the status name column. I can type status in transit here. Um, again, I can limit the columns a little bit so it's a little easier to see, um, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to limit it just to um, the status name 
and maybe the material type and the effective location. Or let's do the in-transit destination service point so I can see where it's going. And if I, looks like I accidentally added the atom ID, but I will um, hit submit and I can see that there are two items in transit um, heading to CERC desk one. So um, the next type of query you might want to do, you could do simple queries like um, there are uh, statistical codes that are attached to inventory items, but they're often a little bit tricky to query because they're, um, they need to be unpacked so that you can, uh, you can query them uh, individually. So this has been done and we have statistical code tables so I could um, filter by the statistical code of books and very quickly get those records. Um, another common query would be to run um, a list of patrons uh, based on certain properties. So for example, I could go to the user groups derived table, which combines users with um, more information about their, um, their group uh, affiliation. So I can now filter by undergraduate group name and I'm going to show this order function. So I'm gonna add an ordering criterion here and I'm gonna order by expiration date uh, descending. And that means that it's gonna show all the undergraduate users by when they're expiring with the, um, the farthest expiration date at the top. So if I am looking for users that are expiring soon or expiring later, um, I can do some, um, some selections here and maybe send them emails. Uh, finally, I want to share, there is actually a, a fees fines uh, report already shared for um, the, the app, but I'm going to show um, something kind of similar in our, uh, in our derived tables. We have something called fees fines actions, uh, our accounts actions, which allow us to look at the transactions on a fees fines account. So I might um, filter to a particular account that I've pulled out of the, the app. Um, I've got this identifier here. And if I hit submit, um, I can see all the transactions for this particular uh, fees fines accounts. Um, this is another one we're having an ordering function where I'm listing it in a particular order might be useful. So I'm going to order by um, transaction date ascending. So I can make sure I'm, I'm reading all these transactions in order. And I can see when I get to the um, transactions columns that the story is very clear. It starts with a balance of nine, 99, and then there's a transaction of one, which is a, a partial payment. It goes, the balance goes down to 98, 96, 93, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's it for me. Um, this is up on Snapshot and uh, is uh, available for you to play with. And Angela, there's a question in chat. Um, any chance we'll be able to resort results by call number order rather than alphanumeric? Yes. Um, so the order by uh, allows you to sort by any column. So if there's a, a sortable call number column in the table that you're interested in, you can sort by that column. All right. And so I think that sounds like a no for things like LC where it's not exactly an alphanumeric sort. You know, we've... Um, Exactly. Yeah, we've talked about about whether this kind of transformation is something that has to happen in the app or if we're if we can do some kind of transformation to make the LC sortable just in the um, in the LDP. And I don't think we've created a function like that, but I do think that that's um, that's something that's possible, that there could be a transformation of the data that happens outside of the app to make it sortable. I think it would be um, a wonderful feature for the apps to to make that transformation, but uh, I think I think it is possible that something like that could be developed for the LDP. All right, good to know. Yeah. All right, um, and now we're on to Prokopovich and Matt. I hope there's Matt. Matt Connolly, are you there? You're still muted. All right, we're gonna skip Matt. We'll come back to Matt if he 
He may have gotten uh, called away to something. In the meantime, I am going to share my screen and we'll uh, jump over Prokopovich and uh, do the LDP um, for pretty much all of the Juniper development cycle. Um, the LDP has been working with data import on um, analyzing the data import processes and workflows, sizes of files, finding where there were issues with the uh, flows or issues with memory. And so uh, Varun, uh, uh, along with all of the PTF folks, we've been having twice weekly meetings between FolioJet and PTF. I cannot describe the amount of work that they've done to help us with analysis and um, understanding of the, the many interactions that happen when you're trying to import files and update inventory and report all of it back. So I'm gonna turn things over to Varun to uh, show a few slides about the work that they've done. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, in PTF, uh, we did performance testing of data import for different custom job profiles. The current state of data import with Iris Hotfix 3 release is for create import, we create instances, holdings, items, and SRS record. So we have been able to import uh, max 50,000 mark record. And for updates, we can successfully up update 5,000 mark records at max. Um, as you can see below in import statistics, as the number of mark records increases, the total duration for create and update imports gradually increases. So for uh, 1,000 mark record, uh, the create and update will take five minutes, but as we increase the mark record, the uh, duration uh, gradually increases. Um, as and we we can run a data import with or without background activity for import with background activity data import is relatively stable uh, with check in check out for five users then uh, we uh, we were also able to do concurrent import by different tenants however data import will take longer to complete um, moreover we are doing check-in check-out as a background activity. So check-in check-out time increases by 50 to 100 percent depending on the number of concurrent users. Um, then data import takes uh, twice longer to complete for uh, create and update uh, when uh, with with the background activity. And uh, below is the uh, summary and test results link if you want to reference it. Um, next slide. Uh, so during this testing per process, PTF and FolliJet were able to develop key settings and configuration that significantly improve the performance of data import. We came up with uh, Kafka parameters so uh, the auto create topics enable is true. When, when this is true, data import will automatically create topics on the fly as required uh, by the data import modules. For uh, log retention minutes, uh, this can be between 70 minutes and 300 minutes. It has to be at least uh, 70 minutes in order for all messages to be consumed. Uh, then the next one uh, was another key where upgrading the Kafka cluster to version 2.7 uh, significantly improved performance by 30%. Uh, um, then uh, moving next to more inventory. So for inventory specific configuration, uh, so the first parameter, uh, more, the inventory module will run 10 Kafka consumer instances in parallel, which will speed up data import jobs. Second one, uh, mark 
web instance hrid uh, equals to 10 means like it will uh, run 10 kafka consumer instances in parallel the next one uh, kafka consumer max poll record when it's equal to 10 it means that the consumer will poll 10 records in batch and larger the size of the batch the longer inventory uh, will take to complete so 10 is a sweet uh, spot over here um, and the last one for all the above configurations to work smoothly mod inventory needs at least uh, two GBs of uh, memory. Um, so next slide. So, uh, so the major improvements in the data import uh, since initial Iris release. So the create job profile is used to create instances, holdings, uh, items, and SRS. So now the data import job will not create any duplicate records uh, when we when we do this. Um, also, it can do repeated updates on existing records. Then multiple when multiple instances of data import landing page were open, uh, it used to consume hundred percent of database CPU in an idle state. So the landing page was polling the job status forever in the background. Um, so FolieJet were able to get it down to 10%. At the same time, mod source record manager was consuming 90% CPU when idle. FolieJet were able to get it down to 50%, which is a considerable performance improvement. Um, in uh, in vertical scaling such as uh, bumping cpu and memory resources of data import module uh, improves performance uh, significantly for iris hotfix 2 for the data import modules next slide uh, now th this is the remaining work that uh, that still needs to be done for uh, kiwi release so improve performance by creating more records for create and update jobs uh, then uh, reduce kafka message size so there are a few kafka topics whose message size is greater than 200 kilobytes uh, it 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 uses a lot of uh, cpu to process these memory to process these messages so reducing the message size will reduce the burden on CPU. Um, and also uh, it has to do serialization and deserialization. Um, and if the message size are smaller, then uh, CPU will, will have enough room to uh, do the serialization and deserialization. So getting message size, um, to less than that uh, 200 kb will will be uh, very beneficial um, then remove event cache topic uh, this topic creates spikes in mod inventory and kafka brokers which makes data import unstable and unpredictable so this is this is a very uh, good uh, feature uh, to have uh, to get it fixed as part of kb and resiliency when module crashes. If modules such as uh, mod inventory crash due to any reason, the data import job will be uh, stuck or uh, will complete with fewer uh, records. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have. So uh, let me know if you have any questions or anything. Thank you. Marie, Thank you very uh, much, Varun. Yeah. Um, I know uh, we've spent so much time in uh, Juniper working on this and it's been really good to see the results so far and to know that we have a, a plan moving forward for Kiwi now. All right, so um, Matt has been found. So I'm going to stop sharing and we'll circle back real quick.
oh, Matt wasn't expected to demo anything. Never mind, um, Prokopovich. That that was a um, a false flag. Okay, so let me share my screen again real quick. And so, with regards to the next couple of sprints, they are normal size two week sprints. Um, we're finishing up Juniper bug fixes this week, and um, and. Anybody that's not already prepped for Kiwi is hopefully finishing up their prep. And uh, Sprint 121 is, um, we shouldn't be doing any Juniper work because it should be all beautiful with a bow and ready to release at the beginning of the sprint. And we will be heading deep into Kiwi development. So in the rest of the deck, you have slides that show the next bits and pieces coming for the various teams. Um, many of the teams are going to be focusing heavily on the um, automated testing work, the API tests with Karate and migration from big test to RTL just and the end to end tests, um, as well as some feature work here and there. So thank you for everybody for hanging in. We made it to the very end. Um, are there any questions after 85 minutes of this meeting? So thank you to all the teams who have presented. Great work by everybody. And I lost the chat. Is there anything in chat that's important? Nope, it's all good. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. You get five minutes back. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. So.